Hi, I'm Sean, and welcome to Animal Tracks. And I'm Allison, and this is Leia, the most beautiful dog in the world. Wait a minute now. This is the most beautiful dog in the world. Look at that face. Oh, that you can't be serious. Face. I mean, he's cute, but... <laughs> okay, he's not exactly Mr. Canine America, but he's certainly one of the smartest dogs in the world. I'll give you that. He is pretty smart. Well, as you can see, we both own dogs, and we have some pretty strong feelings about their looks and intelligence. If you have a pet dog, you know they can learn to do lots of things. They can sit and fetch and speak and roll over. Well, watch. This is one of Leia's best tricks, if I can get her to do it. Ready? Leia, shake. Good girl. <laughs> That's pretty good. Sometimes dogs can learn things on their own, though, and things that we don't want them to know how to do. Like my dog, for instance, has learned how to open up doors, including refrigerators. Well, today we're going to meet some wonderful dogs who've learned to do some amazing things to help people. Yeah, so come and join us as we take a look at the world of dogs and we learn how man's best friend can be man's best helper. One of our first stops was a ranch outside of Ashland to see a friend of ours, George Fry. George raises sheep and he trains dogs to help him with the work on his ranch. When ranchers like George raise sheep and cattle, they have to move the animals from one pasture to another so the animals won't overgraze any specific area. They may also need to bring the livestock into a barn or special pen at night so they aren't as vulnerable to predators. George trains dogs to help him move his sheep around. <coughs> The dogs he trains are Australian Shepherds. Like their name suggests, Australian Shepherds were first bred and used in Australia, but they are now one of the main breeds of herding dogs used throughout the world. We had the chance to meet one of George's Shepherds, a beautiful dog named Blue, and George showed us how Blue herds the sheep from one place to another. After we watched Blue work, I asked George how old the dogs are when he starts training them. They vary. Some dogs are ready to start at six months, some dogs are ready to start at a year, and some of them it's almost two years old before. It's just according to how much they're into working stock, I think. And some of them never have enough interest to be good. Some of them, they, you can teach them up to a certain level and that's as far as they want to go. They just don't want to push. When it gives to be, so it's not a fun game anymore, it's too much work game, then they just back off, you know, and that's what I found. A true working dog, I've started them at five months and, uh, and have a lot of success with them. So. Besides his own dogs, George also trains Australian Shepherds and Border Collies for other people. And after he's trained the dogs, though, usually the owners have to come in for some training, too. Yeah, and I give lessons and I train other people's dogs. I mean, most of them that I train, if they don't come take a few lessons, the dog can't do anything for them because they don't know how to work the dog. I can take the dog out and work the dog and it works great and they take it out and the dog, you know, doesn't get the job accomplished because they don't know how to do it. So then they come take a few lessons and then basically they have an idea how to work their dogs. And, and I have one here now from the Applegate that I'm, area that I'm training and she's going to come take lessons next month. And then I'm training a border collie for a friend of mine that has a cattle ranch. And uh, I've trained two other dogs for him. And he told me that the first dog I trained for him is capable of about what four or five horse riders can do. So he's really is happy with the dog. He's found out what a real help a dog can be. Sit. Away. Sit. If you saw the movie Babe, you heard the same commands George is using. When the trainer says go by, that means the dog is supposed to swing around to the left or clockwise. When the trainer yells away to me, 
The dog goes in the opposite direction, which is around to the right or counterclockwise. Now go by. Away, Blue. There. Easy. Easy. Besides using his dogs to help out on the ranch, George also takes the dogs to herding competitions. In fact, he's won several national titles with Blue and two other dogs named Shine and Nikki. We went to a local competition to check out the action and to watch George compete with his dog. It's not just Australian Shepherds and Border Collies that participate in these herding trials. Other breeds of dogs, such as this spunky Welsh Corgi, also come to show off their skills. You thought dogs only herd sheep and cattle, think again. After watching herding dogs in action, we had a chance to see another way dogs can help people. We spent a day with the Medford Police Department's canine unit. The officers in this unit work especially with trained police dogs. We were lucky enough to get to join them for some of their training exercises. Welcome to the world of the Medford Police Department's canine unit. Just to tell you that the basis, the basis for, for all the work we do is obedience because we have to have control and obedience of our dog. It's very important in, in everything that we do that we have to maintain control of the dog. The dog has to, uh, has to obey us. Dogs make bad decisions on their own, so it's our responsibility to think for the dog and to guide it and tell him what we want him to do. What we're going to do is just a little a basic obedience. We'll do some stuff on lead, which is with the leash. We also do obedience off lead, so to show the control that we have over the dogs. Um, so we'll do some simple movements and turns, and, uh, and you can just well, follow us through there. Also, our commands are, uh, Oxer's commands are in Flemish, and uh, Tanya's and Louis's commands are in Dutch. Uh, those are the countries that they were born and raised in, and they're familiar with that language. See that we don't always have to use uh, verbal commands. We can also do hand signals with our dogs, and they'll watch what we'll do. Just leave your dog in the sit stay, and we'll go forward, and we'll do some hand signals softly. you know what your dog can do uh, that also helps you on the street you, you kind of know what they're capable of and the dogs have a lot of fun as you'll see he gets a kick out of this come on Favorite thing. The 
vehicles that were given for the dogs are outfitted and it's uh, $3,000 in additions just to a regular police car, which runs about $23,000. Uh, the, the additions include, first of all, as you can see, the, the back area. We don't transport anyone. That's only for the dogs. And we have a raised up portion that allows the dog to get in and out of the car a lot easier. Uh, as well as that, we have a, a door pop, which is a piston driven remote control that allows us to pop one of the back doors where the dog can let himself out and come and find us if we should ever need to. And we usually use that in emergency situations so the dogs know when they're coming out uh, it's time to work. Uh, the other things the car features are protection of the dog. For instance, uh, we have a temperature sensor in the back. If it gets to 100 degrees in the car, it drops the back windows, the fan comes on, and the horn honks continuously until somebody comes and, and removes the dog. And we've had that actually save one of our dogs during this last summer uh, because the, the air conditioner overheated. So that we, we, uh, we really value that it saved one of our dog's lives. Uh, also, we have a, what's called a secure car button that allows us to leave our cars running during hot weather with the air conditioning going and it, it's uh, impossible to steal the car with it in that condition. Uh, even if you got into the car, if you try to put it in gear or press any of the buttons, it immediately kills the, the engine. Uh, also, we have a screen in between the driver's compartment and the dog that we, we can leave up or down. If someone so desired to get in the car, they would have to take the risk on whether or not the screen was up. So, uh, as you can see in the back here, we have a water dish. Uh, Overheating is probably the biggest problem we have with the dogs. And we also have a roll bar behind and a screen uh, over the windows so that the dogs, uh, a lot of dogs are aggressive to anybody coming near the cars and that way they don't bite or break the windows. And that's basically it as far as uh, additions to the car. Um, we are permanently assigned the cars and that way our dogs are always dri driving in one of these. It's not safe to transport them in a regular type car. And with the mat uh, on the bottom, their claws can grip. They, they love their cars. It's their security blanket. Next, Officer Taylor and his dog, Louie, demonstrated a handler protection. This is when a dog protects his handler from an attacker. The canine police dogs are trained to bite only if the police officer is being attacked or threatened with a weapon so that the dog might be able to save the officer's life. The dogs are never used simply to hurt or subdue a suspect. Hey you, show me your hands. Come on right now, show me your hands. Get away! Show me your hands. This is all dog. Tanya. She is uh, Metro Police Department's cross-trained Malinois and I'm going to uh, tell you about the narcotics training that she's been through. We completed a 200-hour course in narcotics training where Tanya was taught to uh, detect the odors of marijuana, methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. And during the training the dogs are never injected with any of the drugs. They're only uh, taught the odor of the drug. So what we would do is, very quickly describing, we would take this towel, which is the play toy, and or with the reward, and we would uh, scent this up with the narcotics. We would put this in a box with marijuana or heroin or something like this, and just the odor would permeate the towel. Then we would play with the dog, play catch or something like that, and the dog would then de uh, be uh, imprinted with the narcotic. This is just so that they know what the odor is, so that when they find it, the reward or the action then is to aggressively alert and have a change in body mannerism, which is to bark and scratch at an object. Okay. And that's what we call an aggressive alert. And then the dog is rewarded with this towel, which is their play toy, and tells them that they've successfully completed the exercise. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, run the dog along an area of about 40 or 50 feet here. We're going to let the dog search for narcotics that have been hidden. Uh, it's a test for myself and a test for the dog. 
when the dog finds a narcotic, she will tell me by her aggressive alert and body change where the narcotics are, she'll then be rewarded. Besides sniffing out drugs, a police dog can also use its keen sense of smell to find a suspect hidden in a building. The canine unit trains the dogs to do this by having an officer hide in the warehouse and then letting the dog search for that officer. Attention to the building, it's the police department canine team. Make your presence known, it will be searched by police dog. <clears throat> he will find you and you may be bitten. This will be your last warning. After they took the time to show us all the amazing things that their dogs can do, the Medford Police Department Canine Unit was off again working hard to make the world a safer place. We're in Central Point, Oregon to visit a very special place that's known all over the country for the wonderful work they do. This place is called Dogs for the Deaf. It was founded in 1977 and what they do is they train dogs to live with people who are deaf or hard of hearing and to help those people with the different kinds of sounds they wouldn't be able to hear otherwise. So it works sort of like the guide dogs you've probably seen that help blind people, only these dogs are especially trained to help people who cannot hear. Now as a hearing impaired person myself, who may someday be deaf, it's especially interesting to me to see this wonderful work that these dogs are doing and the very special way that they can help people. Boy, right there. All right, buddy. Here you go. Get, get that squirrel. Get that squirrel. That's a good job. All right. What a good boy he is. Initially in training, uh, we teach them to go check out the sound first so they'll know where it is because we'll start um, with a sound that we can move around to get them the idea of searching out the sound. Oh, uh -huh. And then once they're in the home, they know the door is always going to be in the same place. The phone is usually always in the same place. So a lot of times they won't even go check the sound out first. They'll hit the person and take them right to it. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. That's a good boy. That's a good boy. <laughs> the thing that we tell our recipients also is that the toys need to be located at the sound. If I'm going to the door and my toy is over here, pretty soon he's going to start going over there because he knows that's where his reward is. Oh. So one of the reinforcements that we use for the dogs is having the toy actually at the sound. Mm -hmm. So the dog knows as soon as I do a good job, I get my reward right away. Where do you get all the dogs that you train here at Dogs for the Deaf? We travel from Los Angeles up through Washington State and we go to shelters and humane societies and we rescue the dogs from there. Some of them are donated and some of them we do have to pay for when we go to the shelters. We do get a few dogs from private individuals. So most of these dogs are dogs that might have been put to sleep or? Yes, we have had several that we've rescued on that day when they were scheduled to go down within an hour's time. Simon came from Jackson County Animal Shelter. He's one of our local boys. 
When you go to a shelter, how do you know which dog is going to be a good hearing dog? There are a few things that we look for with the dogs. We want a dog that's energetic. We want one that's playful, as you saw with Simon and his toys. He likes them a lot. We want a dog that is going to show a little bit of um, security within itself. Um, we'll, you know, go outside and clap our hands or jump up and down and see if the dog is going to cower, if it's afraid. And those kind of dogs we would not take. We want one that's going to have a little bit of confidence in himself or herself. Does it matter what kind of dog they are? No, actually we haven't found that um, any particular breed is better than another or any particular male or female. Um, pretty much if the dog has a willingness to learn and a toy drive and they like people, that's pretty much what we go by. Since they began their work 20 years ago, Dogs for the Deaf has placed more than 450 dogs throughout the United States. And every year they get many thank you letters from the deaf and hearing impaired people whose lives are now so much better because of the special dogs they have to help them. You've probably seen a news report before that had a dog like the ones that you're going to meet. These are search and rescue dogs. They help track and find people who are lost or hurt, or even in some cases, been trapped in an avalanche or a collapsed building. We joined the volunteers with the Jackson County Search and Rescue on one of their training days to see how they teach these dogs to find people. And what we will do first is a puppy runaway, which is um, just a little short exercise, which is used for motivation for young dogs and for our other dogs, too. We, we'll take our Finnish dogs and, and do a puppy runaway because they think that's a blast. <laughs> So Puppy Runaway basically is we'll have somebody say hi behind that tree over there and make a little bit of noise, wave their hands or something like that. And then the person who is with the dog will, handling the dog, will release the dog. They'll hopefully race right into the person and then come running back to the handler and take him back into the person, which is one of the initial steps. <laughs> Now the dog is going to go down there and find her, and in the process the dog has now made the find. The dog is, is going to come back to the handler. The handler is backing away from the dog to make, keep the enthusiasm, and that's the alert that tells the handler that the dog has made the find. Now the dog is in essence taking the handler to the person that, it's, that it has found. So what you have here is a big hide and seek exercise. And then there's praise, and praise, and praise, and food. <laughs> Most of these dogs work for food. The jacket that you see being put on there, the orange jacket, is called a shabrack, and it serves several purposes, one of which it denotes to the dog that it's going to go to work. Secondly, it identifies the dog as a rescue dog, and thirdly, it serves as protection, uh, specifically around barbed wire fences and so forth like that. After we watched the puppy runaway drills, the search and rescue folks demonstrated a much more difficult training exercise with another dog, Jesse. This time the person playing the lost victim is very far away from where the search begins. She's being very quiet and still and is well hidden behind a bush and under a garbage bag. All these factors make it very difficult for the dog to actually find the person. Let's just see how well Jesse does in finding her. On another run of the same exercise, our camera person and Allison met with Reggie, a golden retriever who was pretty excited to find both of them hiding out there with the rescue volunteer. Oh. 
We asked Frank which breeds make the best search and rescue dogs. We are partial to the sporting breeds in this particular group. Uh, we have found through experience that the sporting breeds are very human oriented. S secondly, they bond well with people. Thirdly, they're very eager to please and they enjoy this kind of work. So, by sporting breeds, which types do you The retrievers, uh, Labradors, Goldens, flat coat retrievers. Another training exercise that we got to see is called a tract. This is when a dog is looking for a specific person. So the dog is given something to smell that has the scent of that person on it. The dog follows the scent until hopefully he or she finds the victim. All of the training is always positive. There are no uh, negative corrections or anything like this. If the dog does not perform well, then you just put that one aside and you try to get the dog to do another good one. If the dog doesn't st still do another good one, they have good days and bad days. So what you do, what you do then is you put the dog away until uh, the next dog, day. Well, today we've seen all kinds of wonderful things that dogs do to help people, but maybe one of the most important things is just to be our best friends, to be there, to make us feel better, and to always be ready to have a good time. Right, Leah? Hey, thanks for watching Animal Tracks. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>